when I asked, I said, hey, what are we speaking about? What are we talking about? Uh, he said, how to overcome anxiety. Um, so that's a pretty big topic, but I know it's something we all struggle with. It's a big part of my testimony, which we'll get into. Um, but yeah, how to overcome anxiety. That's the topic. That's the goal. I'm going to try to help you guys as much as I can. But before I start, I do want to preface. I know that anxiety is a different battle for everybody. It's not the same giant for everyone. Some people struggle really hard. Some people don't struggle as much. Everybody struggles in different ways. Um, so I just want to say that I'm not necessarily trying to offer some sort of plan or a, or a five-step program to be able to overcome anxiety. I do recognize there is no plan to overcome anxiety, but I also recognize there is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. So as I am, yes, I'm trying to offer you some practical advice, but more importantly, I want to offer you the person that is Jesus Christ to overcome anxiety. So I'm going to pray. You guys have your Bibles? Cool. And then we're just going to dive into it. Sound good? Cool. God, we love you. We're thankful for who you are. God, that we get to come together. Uh, we get to just talk about life. We get to just be honest and real. And um, I'm just thankful that you care about us and you care about our problems and our anxieties and the struggles we face. God, I pray that today uh, my words would be yours. Father, and that you would um, just take this moment um, to just break down any chains or any walls or whatever it may be. Father, I give this time to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So when I was thinking about the verse, what verse do I give you guys to overcome anxiety? And the cool thing about the Bible is there's a lot of those verses. There's Philippians 4. 4. Verse 20, I think. Do, do not be anxious about anything, but with everything in prayer and petition, make your requests known to God. That's a very good one, um, and it's something that I would recommend. But I wanted to find a moment in the Bible, a moment of anxiety, and what Jesus' response was to it. A moment of anxiousness and Jesus' response. So I chose John chapter 20. You can open there if you want. If not, I'll just read it to you. Um, it's just kind of the preface for what I'm going to be talking about. John chapter 20, starting in verse 19, we're going to go to verse 31. So John chapter 20, starting in verse 19, I have NIV. I think this is the 84 version, so sorry. This is the Bible I had in my car. Um, starting in verse 19, Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas also called Didymus, it might say called twin in your translation, depending. Um, one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand onto his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Um, that's where we are. That's the text. John 20, verses 19 through 31. I believe a very anxious moment in the Gospels. Jesus had died and the disciples were hiding in a room out of fear for their lives. So their savior, their teacher, their rabbi was crucified on a cross and they were scared to be known followers of Jesus so they hid an anxious moment in the Bible. I specifically wanna focus on this man, this disciple named Thomas. It says he was called Didymus, it says he was called twin. There are two reasons why he was nicknamed Didymus. Scholars believe that Thomas just looked a lot like Jesus. So like just facially features wise, they looked like Jesus, his brother. So they called him the twin because he just looked like Jesus. They're both Middle Eastern men and they looked alike. Um, but 
I believe in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, names have huge, significant meaning. They're way more than surface value. They are your character. They are who you are. I believe Thomas was nicknamed the twin because he is our twin. We look at Thomas and we judge him. He's the doubter. He doesn't believe. The Bible often does this. When we look at characters in the Bible, we like they, they're failures. We're like, look at those failures. The Bible is just holding a mirror up to us. I believe Tom, Thomas is called the twin because we are his twin. And in this moment, Thomas is stuck in between two unsettling realities. Two unsettling realities. One, Thomas, before Jesus, had lived in the world. He'd experienced the world, and he had found it to be unsatisfying. The world was not good enough. It would not fill the desires of his heart. And now, too, he had encountered Jesus. He had seen him perform miracles. He had lived in fullness of God and what it was like to walk side by side, literally, with Jesus. And now, the very thing that gave him life was gone. He's in this awkward spot. I doubt too. <laughs> he experienced the world in its vast emptiness and he experienced Christ and now he was gone. What a moment of anxiety. I believe a lot of us are in similar positions. We are Thomas, right? Have you experienced the world and felt its emptiness? And have you also come to church, experienced Christ, felt his joy, felt his presence, whether it's in worship or the message, but now, where is he? Where has he gone? I don't feel Jesus' presence anymore. Or maybe you never have. So that's the premise. That's my premise. That's the text. This is the moment of anxiety in the Bible. I have three questions um, that I believe that have helped me in my personal life overcome anxiety. And like I said, I do realize it's a different dragon for everybody. Anxiety is no joke. I don't want to just play it off as, oh, we all get anxious sometimes. It is different for everybody. And I do want to offer some sort of a practical plan, but most importantly, the person, Jesus Christ. Amen? Cool. My first question, and I believe this is vital for overcoming anxiety, is have you addressed your past? Have you addressed your past? What am I talking about? Why am I saying that? You guys are in middle school. How much past do you have? I had a lot in middle school, so <laughs> I can imagine. A little bit of my story. I grew up in the church. Always was a church kid. I was birthed basically into children's ministry. That just was my life. Loved the church, grew up in the church, but my home life was not what it seemed. My parents fought. They argued. Um, my dad was a drug addict and a drunk, and um, he was a drug dealer. And it was a very rough home life up until about the age of five when they got divorced. My dad decided to cheat on my mom with my mom's best friend. So... My best friends growing up became my step-siblings, which is a very strange dynamic that you don't realize affects the way you view yourself until you start to grow into adulthood. Um, this other part of my story, um, so, well, I would always go over to my dad's house every other weekend per the court. That was just the rule. And what I would see over there um, affected the way I viewed myself and the way I accepted love uh, because my dad was very abusive, physically, verbally, uh, mentally, I would often see my dad throw my brother against the wall or throw beer or do drugs and try to hit my stepmom. And that was the normal at my dad's house. And at my mom's house, everything was great. I love my mom. She's amazing. She's a warrior. Um, I would be nothing without her. Um, but I had to live in these two realities of at my dad's house, this was normal. We were, he was drunk. He was angry. He was yelling. And uh, at my mom's house, everything was butterflies and rainbows. So it was like this weird dynamic that really affects the way you view yourself. Um, and this next part of my story, I've, reg I've, I've prayed over and I've, I've, uh, I've gone back and forth whether I was going to share this. Um, but the Holy Spirit has given me confidence um, that this is important to share. I'm not going to go into detail, but from the ages of six to eight, I was molested by an older man. It's part of my story. It's something I denied for many, many years. Um, you guys are actually some of the first groups of people I've ever mentioned it to. Um, because it was something that damaged my uh, self-image and identity for most of my life. 
Um, but I grew up in the church, like I said, so I had this dynamic of going to my father's house and it being horrible, but staying with my mom and living with my mom primarily, and I grew up in the church, and I got very involved in ministry at a young age. By the time I was seven, I was in the snack ministry, you know what I mean, like passing out the animal crackers to everybody, just having a great time. By the time I was 11, I was in the worship band, and I'd been playing in live worship bands since I was 11. I'm about to be 23 next month, um, so most of my life has been worship, has been ministry, has been something that I was like so excited and was so life-giving. Um, and my knowledge for the scripture grew like crazy. I fell in love with the Bible. I fell in love with studying God's word and learning about it. And by the time I was 13, I was the punk kid in Sunday school debating the teacher about theology when I was 13. I was that punk kid. I was the annoying one that was like, bro, shut up. I just want my animal crackers. Um, but that was me. That's what I loved. I fell in love with the Bible. And, uh, I didn't realize how negative that was for me because I, I, was, I was knowing so much about the Bible. I knew so much about God, but I did not know him personally. And I believe that came from this neglect for what happened in my past. I'd shoved it down. I had never mentioned it. And there I was, 15 years old, with crippling anxiety, constant panic attacks, and I told no one because I wanted to be in ministry. I wanted to be successful. And what I saw was successful in the modern church was an extroverted person who made people laugh and was, that was an anointed person in my mind, was an extrovert who didn't deal with anxiety, had no problems. So I put on the face, I put on the mask, and I just shoved this stuff down. As I grew older, I got more involved. I started leading youth group ministry. I started leading worship. I started doing all of these things, my passions, my desires. But deep down, I was having a crisis of faith my anxiety was an all-time high. I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how to mention it because people would come to me with Bible questions because I love the Word so much. But on the inside, I did not know Christ personally, and it was crippling. My anxiety was an all-time high. Flash forward, I'm 19 years old. I'm trying to get through this fast. I don't have a lot of time, but I'm 19 years old. I work at a church part-time, and I work at a Christian school. I am teaching Bible history to middle schoolers as my job, and I am a youth assistant at a church, and I've never addressed this stuff from my past. And as I'm telling kids about the fullness of life in Christ, I'm telling them Jesus is the answer. There's so much more to life. I have never addressed what happened in my past. And what happened is I started to deconstruct my faith because I knew all about God, but I did not know him personally. But I could go into my story. I have so many things, but I, I do need to move on a little bit. But why is this important? Why am I talking about? Why, when we're talking about overcoming anxiety, why is the first thing I'm talking about is have you addressed your past? Have you addressed your past? Because I believe if you struggle with anxiety, and I know it's different for everybody. Not everybody has the childhood I had. Not everybody has a super traumatic moment necessarily. But that doesn't mean you don't struggle with anxiety. We all struggle with anxiety in different ways. But I believe, if this is something you struggle with, that there is a moment. So maybe it's traumatic. Maybe it's not. For me, it was a traumatic moment where the enemy, the devil, caused me to believe a lie about myself that affected my identity in Christ. That's why. I say, have you addressed your past? Because there was a moment, whatever it was. For me, my father, he left. He never loved me. He would say things like, I can't believe you're my son. All my other sons are strong and you're weak. He would go to my brother's baseball games, but he wouldn't go to mine. I hated baseball. <laughs> I hate that sport. I hate it, but I played it and I got really good at shortstop, so my dad would come to my games. He never did, not one. And it affected the way I viewed myself. I felt like I wasn't worthy of love. I felt like I didn't deserve love. Everything, I was just trying to earn his attention, his affection, and he wouldn't give it to me. From the ages of six to eight, I was molested. I felt like I had lost my purity at such a young age that affected the way I viewed myself. I already lost my purity. <laughs> What's the point in trying to keep it anymore? It was taken from me. What lie are you believing about yourself? Why? What lie? What happened to you? What evil thing happened to you that the enemy is using against you so that you can't experience freedom in Christ? For me, it was my father, and it was what happened when I was a young child. And I never, 
ever address them. So here I am, 19 years old, leading a youth group, teaching middle schoolers about Bible history, because I was a nerd, (laughs) and I'm crumbling. I have panic attacks. I can't drive. I, I, I don't know what to do. And uh, to top it all off, I was in a relationship at the time, and that relationship fell apart. Um, and I ended up uh, doing things in that relationship that I should not have done. And this girl came forward to the church um, and spun it in a way that got me fired. Consequences for my sin. I got fired um, from, the, from the school and from the church. Everything that I had wanted, everything that I had worked for, I lost. And I remember being like, I'm done with this. <laughs> Whoever this God guy is, whoever this Jesus guy is, maybe he's real, maybe he's not, but I am done with this guy. And it all stemmed from these moments that I had never addressed, never brought to the light, never surrendered over to the Lord. These lies, this evil that happened that isn't Christ. Thankfully, thankfully I went to therapy. (laughs) I checked myself into therapy because I was a mess. I, I was having anxiety attacks, panic attacks. I was suicidal. I'd lost everything. I checked myself into therapy, and this is how God works. My therapist was Christian. <laughs> My professional therapist was Christian, and he could just tell. He could just sniff it. He goes, you're a church kid, dude. <laughs> I know it. Um, but he made me address these things. He made me bring them up. I'd never talked about these things with anybody, and he made me address them, and he made me go back to those painful moments that the devil created for me. The, those evil things that happened to me were not God. I had blamed them on God, but they were not God. But he had to show me that even though it wasn't God, that God was with me through them. And I had to relive them. And I had to reframe the way that I viewed myself because of what happened to me, I was unlovable. What happened to me, I was unworthy of anyone's attention or affection. What lie are you believing about yourself? I know it's... This sounds like such a simple way to say this, but expose it. And what does God say about those things? What does God say about those things? I believe addressing our past is so vital because the enemy's strategy, the devil, his strategy is for us to stuff it down, and the result is we lose our ability to experience peace and freedom in Christ. We lose the ability to. And that was me. I lived in the church my whole life. I had never experienced his peace. I'd never experience his freedom. I'd be in the worship service. I'd be leading the worship service. People's hands are raised. They're crying. I'm like, they always say, the Holy Spirit's in the room. I'd be like, where? (laughs) Where is he at? I don't feel him. I'd never address my past. Thank God my therapist was Christian, and he walked me through those moments. So if you have those moments, look, they don't have to be as dirty as mine. Maybe they are, and that's why I wanted to bring them up, because I know we all go through stuff. Address them, expose them, whether it's with a mentor, a pastor. If you need, hey, if you need professional help, you need professional help. Anxiety is a dragon that is a different size for all of us. But what in your past have you not addressed? Are you stuffing down? Are you denying? Expose that. Knock the legs off of it, because that's what the enemy wants. Right, this shame, this condemnation, which leads me into my second question, or my my second question that's helped me overcome anxiety in my own life, is: Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you addressed your past, and have you received the Holy Spirit? What a church thing to say, right? <laughs> have you received the Holy Spirit? You can do it today. Like you know, if you if you have, you're like, yeah, woo, I have. And if not, you're like, okay, how? <laughs> how do I do that? Um, I'm gonna take this thing off. Oh gosh, can I do that? Is that okay? Hello. Okay. <laughs> because I want to give, this is my, I uh, help teach high school at Zeal. And this is how I always explain how you receive the Holy Spirit as a Christian. Um, so one night I was going home. It was late at night and I live in an apartment. I don't have like my own laundry. So if I want to do laundry, I got to do what the cool people do is go to the laundromat and have a bunch of quarters. And it's super fun. But I was super late at night. I needed laundry for the next day. And, um, I'm getting, it's like midnight, and I have my laundry, I have my book bag, I have a book, and I have my iPad. I have all these things, and I remember thinking, I'm so tired, I just want to get in my apartment, and I want to go to sleep, I want to go to bed, but I want to do it in one trip. <laughs> I'm not doing multiple trips with this. I'm not 
going in, unlocking the door, getting my laundry, getting my book bag, and getting everything in and setting it nice. No, I'm a one-trip dude. So I grab everything. I have my laundry basket, my backpack, my iPad, and like something else. And I'm holding everything. And I'm walking up to the door. And I get to the door. And I'm like, <sighs> my keys are in my pocket. And my hands are full. What do I do? So I'm, I mean, I don't know. You guys, you guys don't like live in an apartment, so you probably don't experience this. But I remember like, okay, I'm like, I can do this. I can balance everything on my right arm. And I can lift my left leg up. And I can get my key out of my pocket. I can jangle it out, and I'll be fine. And as I start to do this, right, I'm bouncing everything. I'm like, I got it. I'm locked in. Dude, I'm already falling right now. I'm locked in. I got it. I dropped everything. Laundry's everywhere. It's on the dirty ground now. I just spent hours cleaning it. It's midnight. My iPad fell on the ground. It cracked. Everything is just like, I'm like, darn it. <laughs> but I was able to enter in <laughs> to the door. I know it's such a silly analogy, but this is the way my brain works. I have ADHD. Um, how do we receive this Holy Spirit? I have one word for you. One. Surrender. Surrender. That's how you receive the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to do all this stuff in my own strength. I'm trying to hold my laundry, my backpack, my iPad, probably a cup of coffee or something, and I can't hold all that in one hand and try to get my key and unlock the door. No, I couldn't do it, and it all fell. It looked like a mess but I could enter into my home. I could step into the thing I was trying to access, but I couldn't because I was holding all this stuff that I was never meant to carry. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you surrendered? Posture in the Christian life is everything. You wanna receive the Holy Spirit? Here's what you gotta do. That's it, that's everything. Surrender, I'm telling you, that is how you receive the Holy Spirit. Mm. What is your posture like towards Christ? What is it like? Are you trying to hold all your stuff? Look, I spent 19 years of my life going to church like this, holding everything. Shame, condemnation, feeling the weight of my father's words that I'm not good enough. Feeling the weight of what happened to me in my childhood that I'd lost my purity. And people are in the worship service and I'm trying to hold all this together. People are just experiencing freedom, and I'm watching chains break. I'm like, I want that. I want to experience that. But I'm, hold, I'm holding all of it. <laughs> Guys, it's already been paid for on the cross. You've been delivered, and the enemy wants you to hold it and go, I'm so ashamed. I'm so ashamed I can't surrender. Jesus says, give me your shame. I made so many mistakes. I, I'm not worthy. I make you worthy. It's been paid for on the cross. You are a child of God. You've been justified. What did we learn? We've been justified by Christ. Sanctification starts with, I can't do it. I can't do it on my own. It's posture. It's surrender. It's open arms towards Jesus. And I couldn't do it because I was so ashamed. Jesus just says, give me your shame. Give it to me. As Christians, we get caught up sometimes in this walk that we're trying to walk towards victory. We're trying to earn our way towards victory. That was my whole life. You're not walking towards victory. You're walking from victory. Does that make sense? Victory has been won when Jesus hung on the cross for your sins. Victory has been paid. Done, signed, sealed, delivered. The enemy wants you to walk around like, oh, man, if I just, man, if I go to church enough, if I serve enough, if I raise my hand enough, my youth leaders are going to think I'm in a good spot. I had everybody fooled for 19 years. I had myself fooled for most of it. This, surrender. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you received the Holy Spirit? I went to this um, conference in um, Portland, Oregon. It was called the Holy Spirit Conference. Changed my life. John Mark Comer is an amazing pastor, and I went to Bridgetown Church. That man has changed my life. This is a quote from just a girl who goes to church in London. <laughs> so I'm not going to give you some like epic C.S. Lewis quote. Uh, but this really spoke to me. This quote right here, I believe, is a perfect posture for surrender. This is just a girl who goes to church 
in London that she sent this into her church. It says this, In the last few months, I have cried more tears, sworn more profusely, felt more anger than I can remember, but the weirdest part is in the middle of it all, I've also come to know more of God's immeasurable kindness. We worship a God who knows how to grieve. We worship a God who doesn't try and minimize the pain of loss. We worship a God who has mercy in our times of anger and frustration. We worship a God who knows when to speak and when to just hold us as we cry. Every human heart that has ever lived has experienced grief. Making the choice to worship in the middle of that pain has the power to transform it into something life-giving and beautiful. The tears will be cried either way. The choice we have is whether to pour them on the feet of Jesus or not. Man, that's surrender. That's surrender. That's the posture that we should have as Christians. God knows what it means to grieve. God knows that evil thing that happened to you. In fact, he was with you the whole time. And you're holding it. And he's just like, give it to me. (laughs) Give it to me. And that's when the peace and the joy will overwhelm you. But that's only on the opposite side of surrender. Does that make sense? I don't have a lot of time. I gotta move on. (laughs) So have you addressed your past? Have you received the Holy Spirit? And lastly, and thirdly, do you know your purpose and identity? Do you know your purpose and identity? This was hit this morning. This was just hit this morning. I want to read this section in this book. Sorry, I read a lot. I love reading. Like I said, I'm a nerd. Um, This is from a pastor. His name is Rich. I had to get help because he's Puerto Rican. Rich Velodas. Is that pretty good? Rich Velodas. He's from New York. He's Puerto Rican. This is where I got the section, John chapter 20. This is where I got it from. This is the idea. This is our identity and purpose right here. It says, as Jesus was arrested and crucified, his disciples deserted him. He was left alone to suffer and die. After his death, burial, and resurrection, the disciples locked themselves in a room for fear that they would be next to die. These disciples had failed Jesus. They dropped out. Who would want these people on their team? The answer is no one except Jesus. Jesus went back to his failed disciples, and instead of bringing up their mistakes, he sent them on mission. After coming face to face with his friends, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And after he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. This is the good news of the gospel. Even when your mistakes don't perform and you can't get your act together, Jesus comes to you and he says, I want you, I'm calling you, and I'm sending you. Jesus knows your problems, your addictions, your failures, your hang-ups, your anxieties, and in spite of all of that, you are invited into his mission. That's our purpose. That's our identity. It's easy, something I did my whole life, to disqualify yourself, because logically, I'm not worthy, not good enough, don't have it in me. But Jesus chose us in spite of that. And instead of getting hung up on our failures and our mistakes and our anxieties, he paid for it on the cross and he sent us on mission. Mm. And God cares about your passions too. Something that I feel like the church doesn't, I mean, maybe they do a good job here, I hope so. Um, but that's like, if you don't want to be in ministry, like, that's okay. <laughs> God cares about your passions and your dreams. For me, I felt so pressured. It was like, for a long time, I want to be a rapper. <laughs> Just fun fact. And I was like, how can I be a rapper and, like, know my purpose and identity in Christ? Um, uh, you can. God cares about your dreams and your passions and your aspirations. Like, so if you want to be, like, a gene designer, great, cool. You can do that. And you can still know your purpose and identity in Christ. Okay, so how do, you, how do I do that? If I want to be a gene designer and I want to make sure that people know my purpose and identity in Christ, do I have to like sew John 3.16 on the butt pocket of every pair of jeans I make? I mean, maybe, sure, but no, you don't. Maybe just make the best darn pair of jeans you know how to make. But when you know your purpose, and he talked about this morning, you want to know your purpose in life? The Bible tells you it's to know God and to make him known. That's it. That's your purpose. That's your identity. But you got to start at a place of humility. What's that thing that you're hung up on? Maybe it's an addiction. 
Maybe it's something that happened to you, but you just, it's traumatic. You don't want to talk about. But the enemy's got you hung up in a lie about yourself. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you surrendered before Christ? Do you know your purpose and your identity? To know Christ and to make him known. When we are confident that our identity is rooted in Christ and our purpose is through him, we're good. <laughs> That's it. We're simple. We're good. We're good. So here's my encouragement. Here's my practical steps for you. Like I said, I know anxiety is different for everybody. I don't want to make light of the situation that is, I keep calling it this dragon because that's what it is. It devours, it scorches. I know it's different for everybody. And if you're really, really struggling, man, I want you to feel heard. Man, I want you to feel loved. Man, I want you to just be wrapped up in the presence of the living God. I know it's different for everybody. And sometimes offering a plan doesn't seem helpful, but I am offering you a person, and that is Jesus Christ, the living God, who paid for whatever happened, whatever you're struggling with, it's paid for. You're done. You're walking from victory. You're not earning nothing. Here's my encouragement. Clear your dirty laundry. Whatever that means. For me, whether it's the literal, I drop my laundry on the ground, or whatever it is, clear it. You got addictions? You got stuff that you know is dragging you down? Get a leader, confess. It's not to bring shame and condemnation. Because the Bible says, in the presence of the living God, there is no condemnation. There's none whatsoever. There's no shame. And if you're feeling shame, that's not God. There's consequence for your sin, yes. When I made that mistake to cross boundaries with a girl when I was working at a church, my consequence was, I can't work at a church right now. <laughs> that's a consequence. But there was no shame in the presence of the living God. It's none. It's no condemnation. Clear your dirty laundry so that you can feel the peace and the joy of the living God. Second encouragement is to find and listen for the Spirit. Another very churchy thing to say. Find and listen for the Spirit. What does that mean, Mr. Fancy Word Man? How's your Devo time? Do you have a devotional time? Pastor Jairus was supposed to speak here, but something when he was mentoring me through all this, he would every time I come to him, I'm struggling. I'm anxious mess, all this stuff. He would always ask me two questions. Are you reading your Bible? And are you praying? And most times, I wasn't. Or I was, but it wasn't for a good intention. How's your Devo life? And I get, you guys are in middle school, so it's like Devo life. Like, cool, great, yeah, got that. Um, and maybe you're like, I don't have any time. I have to go to school. You have time. <laughs> you have time. I work seven days a week. <laughs> you have time. I'm not trying to say you got to read two hours every single morning. I don't do that. <laughs> but start small, aim big. Start small, aim big. Navy SEALs are the craziest humans on the planet of Earth. They destroy their bodies, and they defend our country, and they jump into negative 40-degree water with like shorts on. They're crazy. There's an interview I love with a Navy SEAL. Um, he was asked, man, how do you have the discipline to jump into freezing cold water and destroy your body every day? And he said, I wake up at 5 a.m. and I make my bed. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, man. That, that makes no sense to me. His point was, if you don't have discipline over the small things in your life, you're not going to have discipline over the big things in your life. So he starts making his bed in the morning. He's not going to want to jump in the water. He's not going to do a million push-ups. He's not going to want to punch a wall or something. I don't know what Navy SEALs do, but um, <laughs> well, how's your diva life? Start small, aim big. If you only got 10 minutes in the morning, great. You got 10 minutes to read and pray. Five minutes, read a couple verses, five minutes pray. You don't know what praying is? My therapist tricked me. I wanted to stop praying when I was deconstructing. He said, well, just keep a diary. He tricked me. <laughs> That was praying. I didn't even realize it. For me, most of the time I pray now, I write. I was tricked. I felt cheated, but it changed my life. <laughs> how's, your, what, how's your diva life? 10 minutes, good. 15 minutes, great. Aim, start small, aim big. What are you doing at church? Do you like church? Do you come to church just because your parents make you? Good, nice, awesome. Fall in love with Jesus. 
find and listen for the Spirit. And it starts in those small moments, like Devo time, and what are your intentions to come to church? And lastly, know your identity and purpose. It's to know Christ and to make him known. Something I pray every single day for my zeal students, whom I would literally die for. You guys are my family, and now you guys are my family. As I pray this, I pray my kids don't just believe in God, but they know God. That's what I want for you guys. I believed in God my whole life, but I didn't know him. I always give the example of Michael Jordan. I love him. I know everything about that man. I have his shoes. I know his stats. He's the greatest basketball player of all time. Better than LeBron by a long shot. But I don't know him personally, right? <laughs> I don't know his favorite food. I don't know where he goes to eat. I don't know where he lives. I mean, I don't know anything about the guy personally. That was my relationship with God. I pray that's not the same for you. <laughs> I pray you know him personally because he's a personal God and he wants to speak with you and he wants to have a relationship with you. So much so, he died on a cross so that you could just have a relationship with him. That's love. How much time do I have? Not a lot. Okay, sorry guys. I really wanted to do a Q&A because I feel like you want to be like when you struggle with anxiety, you want to be heard. That's what I did. I, 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 you want to be heard. And maybe we have time. If nobody has questions and it gets really awkward and uncomfortable, I'm cool with that. I'm an introvert. I love to sit in silence, okay? That's my thing. This is, I'm really uncomfortable now talking. So sitting in silence would be great. I do want to open up some questions if so. If not, I just want to offer prayer for you guys. Simple. Just prayer. Um, but... Before that, does anybody have any questions? Because I know, like I said, I'm not trying to offer just a plan. I want you guys to feel heard. Katie, why are you laughing? I mean. <laughs> yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, you guys are middle school, so you have a lot of time to do this. But I would really recommend a mentor in your life, um, someone you trust that is not your age, because y'all goofballs. You need somebody who's older than you, wiser than you, and has been through life, right? For me, it's this guy named Jesus. He's amazing. Um, and he's older than me, wiser than me. I'm about to get married in two months. He's been married like 10 years. So it's just like a great person to go to where I can go, hey, man, this is my thing. This happened, and he can go, oh, man, that stinks, just like God does. He, sometimes, there's sometimes you just need to be held when you need to cry, and sometimes you need to get slapped in the face. That's what mentors are for. Yeah. So practically speaking, do you have a mentor? And more than one. Maybe it's your parents if you have a good relationship with them, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's your pastor, your youth pastor, whatever. I urge you guys, find that person. Find that person. Because that's what it's all about. It's all about community. It's all about family. This is family. This is love, baby. So you need, you need a good papa and a good mama, okay? <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> hey, that's okay. You can put the hoodie down. Okay, that's fine. Um, I don't want to force you guys to ask questions, like ask me questions now. Um, but what I do want to offer is I do want to offer prayer. Um, I don't know if, you, if a lot of you guys struggle with anxiety or just a little bit of you, but statistically, you guys do. Um, and I do. It's something I still struggle. I've overcome it. I've surrendered to the Lord, but sometimes it feels like it's in my rear view mirror. You know what I mean? Like trying to catch up to me. So um, I just want to offer prayer. If it's something you struggle with, you want prayer for, um, you need prayer for, I just want you to do something that causes anxiety. I want you to come forward here <laughs> and just step forward because we're going to name it, we're going to claim it. Hey, I struggle with this. I want to surrender it before the Lord. And we're just going to pray. I'm going to pray. I want to have the leaders come behind you guys and just we're going to bring this thing in front of the living God. Cool? If not, I'll sit in silence. Lunch is, we got like eight minutes till lunch, guys. I'll sit here, bro. I'll do it. <laughs> but I just want to open it up. 
Does anybody want to come forward and receive prayer for anxiety? Oh, yeah. yeah. Of course. Absolutely. You could be 64. <laughs> I don't care where, where you're at. I want this for anybody in the room. God wants this for anybody in the room. This is the first step. Acknowledgement is a big step. That's how you kick the legs off of some of this stuff. Acknowledge it. Bring that sucker to the light. Amen. Mm. I remember the first time I genuinely felt the peace of the Lord. Uh, I had been in like my fourth therapy session. My therapist made me do this thing where I thought I was an extrovert my whole life. That's because that's what was successful in the church. So that's what I made myself to be. And he told me, Jonathan, you're killing yourself. <laughs> you're an introvert and you're filling up your schedule to be around people so that you can feel like something you're not. Know who you are, be confident in it. And he made me go on dates alone. <laughs> I would go to Outback alone. I get a 20 ounce steak alone. <laughs> I go watch the sunset alone. And I would journal during that time. He made me journal and we go over it in therapy. It was very uncomfortable at first, but I remember I was writing in my journal and I experienced the peace of God for the first time. And I just wept. And you know what the Lord did? He held me. He held me in that moment. Because for the first time ever, I surrendered. And that's when the peace and the joy of the Lord comes. So anybody else, I give you like, I give you like 10 more seconds. Either way, I'm going to pray for you. This is, this is a little secret trick that we do. I'm going to pray for you either way. Amen. What time is it? Well, leaders, you want to lay hands. I don't know if you guys want to, but I believe in the laying of hands. Because we're family. We're family. I'm just going to pray. Simple prayer, nothing crazy. But I believe when, we, when we're praying, we're talking to the living God. God is a relational being. He wants to hear from us. One of my favorite moments in the Bible is when God is super mad at the Israelites and Moses is like, hold up, wait, God, whoa, wait, God, remember who you are. You are kind and slow to anger and rich in love. And God changes his mind, which is a crazy thing. Now, you can debate that all you want, but what it does show me is this. God is a relational being, and he cares about you, and he wants to talk to you. So that's what we're going to do. We're just chatting. We're just talking to, the, talking to God, our Father. So I'm going to pray. That's it. So God, we love you. We're thankful for this moment, God. Thank you for your word, that it is true, that you are who you said you are, that that means that you lived a perfect life, that you died on a cross, that you rose again so that we could have relationship with you. Father, I thank you for everybody in this room. You know their story. You know their heart. You know their posture. I pray that today, today, right now, would be the beginning of a posture of surrendering to you. That this moment, oh, God, that your peace would fall. I pray a simple prayer. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, fall. Fill the hearts of everybody in this room. Hmm. Thank you that you're a relational being, that you care, that whatever happened in our past, whatever thing we're caught up, whether it's an addiction, whether it's a, a traumatic experience that happened in our past, God, I pray that we can surrender it before you now and we can walk free, that we would be like Thomas, that yes, sometimes we're stuck in this unsettling reality where the world isn't good enough and God, you don't feel like you're there. But you say, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And you say, go. 
I send you on mission. So, Father, now I pray that you would baptize these people in the Holy Spirit, that they would experience your peace, that the bondage of anxiety would be broken, that the enemy has no more power here as we lift the name of Jesus, the powerful name of Jesus, the freeing name of Jesus. Break the chains of anxiety. And that today, today they'd feel your peace. Today, right now, in this moment, they'd feel your joy. That you are close, that you've never left. You're a good father. Mm. So we're thankful, God, in this moment that we get to do this. We get to lay hands. We get to be family. As we go into lunch, I pray that this moment wouldn't fade. That we go through the rest of the day with fervor, with zeal for who you are and what you've done in our lives. It's your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.